city of 200,000, but the experimental design was designed a house for people who come from half the city, 20 place house for 20 of the kids, and the control group would be staying in hospital. A bit like the Brooklyn's experiment design. And the same in Portsmouth, which coincidentally is also with about then, about 200,000. But then the Wessex experiment extended when the post ED working party, which was a body set up to try and work out what had gone wrong at Ely and what they should do in its place, came forward with the white paper better services for the mentally handicapped. And that provided provision norms. If you look at the white paper, it's table five, it's a whole series of figures about the amount of, of provision should be made in every total population of 100,000 on average for people with lonely disability. And so the Wessex experiment was extended and there were another couple of units uh, for children and there was one unit for the most handicapped adults. And so as we move into the 1970s, we have continuing hospital scandals uh, departmental policy at that time was still to try and upgrade and fix the hospital environment. Um, so you've got Anna Gunsberg, you, you, some of you may know the name of Herbert Gunsberg, who was a psychologist and developing assessment scales for people with learning disabilities. His wife, Anna, was an architect and she went into hospitals and tried to redesign the physical fabric of some of the places to make them more home -like. So you had the idea that you would put curtains on the windows and other radical things like that. <laughs> uh, Wessex was somewhat copied. There were some unit, new units in South Wales and the Sheffield Development Project also brought forward community services about the same sort of scale. Still larger than we would now see as ordinary housing services. But there were also influential developments from overseas. The, the United States, given that it had a constitution, could make constitutional amendments. And they made two very significant ones, either in the 60s or the 70s. One was the right to treatment, in other words, a person could not be detained in a hospital environment unless they were getting active treatment. So you could demand what was going on for this person here. And the other was the right to the least restrictive environment. You also had a right to live in the place that was the least distant from the places that everybody else lived in, in order to receive and these two constitutional amendments were very powerful in, in having a legalistic basis for deinstitutionalization in the United States. Denmark and Sweden were also influential. Uh, Denmark under um, Niels Eric Bank Mikkelsen, as the director of their mental retardation service, enacted uh, what was a Danish word called normal normalizing. It's a bit like normalization, but it was slightly different. But an early form of normalization to bring about reform there. Carl Grunwald, who was the director of the Swedish Mental Handicap Service, and a parent who actually Carl Grunwald established to lead uh, the reform movement called Bank Nirie, also enacted reform on the basis of normalization people should again live in a more normalised setting. Wolf, Wolfensberger also articulated another version of normalisation in the United States. An ENCOR, which is the, stands for the Eastern Nebraska Community Office of Retardation, developed innovative services based on Wolfensberger's <coughs> articulation of normalisation. They were normalisation in practice. Uh, basically moving into ordinary dwellings, small groups, the kinds of things we recognise today. And 
Encore was well known in Britain because Derek Thomas, who was one time director of the National Development Team, was a psychologist at Northgate Hospital, had gone to the States. He visited Encore and he wrote this influential document about Encore when he got back to his country. It's almost a sort of PS to the 1970s that um, the Wessex, <laughs> the results of the Wessex evaluation came out because they were very much delayed. And, um, but they did eventually come out. And the Wessex evaluation, because people said at the time that it wasn't possible to look after people with learning disabilities in the community, it was very much styled as a feasibility evaluation. So the question was, is it possible? And the Wessex evaluation basically showed that the measures on people living in these four units for children and this one unit for adult were as good as, if not better, than the control measures taking people remaining in the hospital. So the we involved in the Wessex evaluation thought it was very clear that <coughs> community care was um, feasible. There was a bit of local difficulty <laughs> in that we came under a great deal of um, pressure from the Medical Research Council and the Department of Health that the research was badly conducted and there was a confidential paper circulating in the Department of Health written by an eminent psychiatrist called John Wing called the Problem of Integration and we had to deal with all of those and I remember <coughs> it was a fun time there was a senior colleague of Judith Jenkins, who many of you may not know of, but she was our senior colleague, and me and Jim Mansell at the time sent three documents off just before Christmas because we attached, we included a Christmas card. And we sent them to the Chief Executive of the Medical Research Council, the Secretary, who's the Chief of the Learning Disability Client Group at the Department of Health. Chief scientists at the Department of Health. And we sent these three documents. One was an analysis of this wing document of the problem of integration. Another was an anal a response to the MRC, a critical MRC site visit to evaluate the research that was done in Wessex. And the other, which was actually written by Judith Jenkins' lawyer husband was an analysis of that same document from the point of view of defamation. And out of that, we won, we ran, we won a re-evaluation which kept the research unit going. Okay, into the 1980s. So, 1980 starts with the King's Fund publishing An Ordinary Life. An Ordinary Life, comprehensive, locally based services for mentally handicapped people. Uh, which put together a description of the type of services that people would like to see in the future. And in 1981, two houses of a number that were to come open. One was in Cardiff, and it was under the Nimrod project. New, Nimrod stands for New Ideas in, for the Mentally Retired in an Ordinary Dwelling. <coughs> and in a total population of 60,000 people who were going to be housing for the people who lived in this catchment population and various other services as well. And then, <coughs> The Andover project was Judith Jenkins, Jim Mansell's, my follow-up to the Wessex uh, survey. And this was the project that got saved by the fact that we managed to renegotiate our existence with the panels of the um, And we opened a house in 1981 and the second house followed on. It was a very small beer, but, it, but that was a project about housing adults with the most severe difficulties and the most severe challenging behaviour. 
the care and the community group paper happened, and that presaged the beginning of the Department of Health recognising that it wasn't going to get anywhere with its policy of trying to tar up the institutions. It was going to cost them a lot of money, and it was going to be unsuccessful, and therefore they had to do something else. And in Wales in 1983, there was the beginning of the All Wales Mental Handicap Strategy, which was heralded as the best policy going in the United Kingdom for a variety of reasons, two of which was that it placed social services as the lead agency and it was a seen as a way of overturning the medical model, which was seen as part of the problem. Not necessarily hindsight doesn't necessarily <coughs> agree with that diagnosis, I happen to say, but anyway, that was was welcome for that reason. And, but the main reason was they promised considerable investment of funding. They promised 26 million pounds. They promised that the amount of extra money 10 years hence, i.e. in 1993, would be 26 million pounds at 1983 prices. So when it came to it, it about 60 million quid was invested in mental and learning disability services in Wales over that 10 year period. And what we see there is just a graph of what we know happened, which is the decline of the traditional institutions over that 20 year period, passage by those two strategies. Okay, so did it do people any good? What was the result of the institutionalisation in terms of people's well-being. So there have been reviews of research evaluating the move from institutional care to community settings in the USA, UK and Ireland and Australia. The Emerson and Hatton's review is an early review in UK and Ireland. Young et al's is a review in Australia. Kim et al's is a restricted review on behavioural stuff in the USA and Cosmo et al's is a more general review of later studies. Cost evaluations have also been reviewed by Eric Emerson and I. We did a paper on the UK cost, but I so I got a paper that should be coming out sometime, but not where. More general. So Emerson and Hatton viewed 71 papers between 18 and 83. And the main findings are most studies, not all, but most studies show significant improvements in five areas. Competence and personal growth, observed challenging behavior, community participation, engagement in meaningful activity, and contact from staff. But reported challenging behavior and social networks did not improve. These reviews are, are relatively consistent with each other. The Australian papers, again, most studies, not all, reported significant improvements in adaptive behaviour, community participation, contact with family friends, interactions with staff, client satisfaction, and parental satisfaction, but challenging behaviour, again, community acceptance and health and health stroke mortality did not improve. The Kim et al. American study was a restricted study and only dealt with behavioural aspects of adaptive behaviour and challenging behaviour. Adaptive behaviour, they found most studies showed significant improvements. Challenging behaviour, no evidence of significant improvement. Some did, some didn't. And, well, some showed significant improvement, some showed significant deterioration, and the majority didn't show improvement. And then in Cosmo et al's study of the impact of institutionalization, seven areas where, again, most studies reported significant improvement, same kind of areas that we've seen before, same kinds of areas not affected Chinese behavior, Psychotropic medication affecting the change of value, health, risks of mortality were either mixed results or worse. Comparative cost. UK studies generally report an increase in cost associated with relocation to the community. 
I, those of you who are involved in it will remember that health service costs were kind of bundled up into a dowry on people's heads that they would take with them. When people are in hospital, they can't receive social security benefits. But when people are out of hospital, they can. So the benefits money kind of gets added to the previous hospital money. So that makes the services more expensive. It is true that the only longitudinal study of costs by Hallam et al. <coughs> reported that the excess costs of community support progressively fell over time. Um, so you kind of go a bit back towards the norm that would be predicted from the previous level. US studies actually generally report a decreasing cost associated with relocation for community. And that you can speculate why UK and US studies are different. My own version would be that because we run social, what the Americans call socialized medicine, we actually have a kind of strategic plan for how to do this. Money did go out of the hospitals when people left. Of course, that didn't happen in this state. So that as the numbers went down, the cost per person would go up. So it all depends on the states where you pitch the comparative point if the costs in the institutions are rising because of the institutionalization, then the studies are going to be affected by that. Anyway. Basically, that leaves us with a number of ongoing areas of concern with what we've achieved with the institutionalization. One, challenging behaviors for system. Second is the prescription of antipsychotic medication for the control of challenging behaviors too high. A recent data from uh, a survey of almost all of general practices in Wales. So it involves a sample of 9,947 adults with learning disabilities found that 29% of those adults were in receipt of antipsychotic medication. Far, far higher than the estimated rate of psychosis. Health inequalities and unhealthy lifestyles remains a problem. And by and large, we're not talking about smoking, we're talking about alcohol abuse, we're talking about obesity and lack of <coughs> exercise. So again, from the same survey, but with a smaller sample, in Wales, 29% of people are overweight and 36% of adults are obese. So, the total of overweight plus obese isn't that different to the general population. It's just the obese figure is higher. But the pattern of activity for about 90% of adults meets the definition of inactive. And that's only comparable to the over 75 year group in the general population. So yeah, if you look at the data below, in terms of 12 or more bouts of moderate or vigorous activity per month, it's 11% in the 75 plus years, and it's 10% in adults with learning disabilities. So it's a very unhealthy uh, lack of physical activity. Service users, social networks remain limited. We're not, we, moving into the community didn't fix it and we don't know how to generate it, is the basic answer. This notion about the mean to the general population of 125, it's kind of difficult to find out what the social networks of the general population is, but this paper um, actually ask people about the size of their Christmas card list. So on average, your average person in Britain 
has 125 people on their Christmas card list, which, you know, is probably a, some measure of social network. Well, it's a hell of a lot more than the six or three that were characteristic of the Robertson et al. community sample of 208 people, 291 <laughs> people with learning disability. And the evidence suggests that friendships do not grow, that friendship networks do not increase with greater length of time spent living in the community. Self-determination remains restricted for people not living <coughs> independently. People have limited choice over where to live and with whom to live. The increasing shortage of out-of-family provision, which I'll come on to in a bit, means that actually people don't have any choice other than to live with their family. And there's increasing out of area placement. So people don't have the choice to live locally in the area <coughs> where they've lived in for their lives or where they have ties and connections. And this may, one of the things thinking about doing this talk is this kind of contrast between the 60s and 70s and all that planning on the basis of epidemiology. We don't do that anymore. So maybe. We're suffering the impact of the fact that there is no strategic planning based on epidemiological data. And therefore, what we see is a rise in the proportion of people who are placed out of area. Staff attention remains poorly related to service users' needs. There may be more staff about, but what are they doing? And who are they doing it with? This is a study, I mean, I could have given you a lot of evidence on this, I just chose this one. This is a study that we did of 50 odd houses. Group one are the 12 houses where the people with the, on average, the lowest adaptive behavior scale score. So the adaptive behavior scale is a score of, that looks at, you can think about it, the severity of disability, if you like. So people with the most severe disabilities live in group one. People with the highest adaptive behaviour scores or the least severe disabilities live in group four and groups two and three are in between. And what you can see there is the main, mean ABS scores going up, as I've said they would. The mean aberrant behaviour checklist scores, which is a measure of challenge of behaviour, goes the other way. And what one would expect if people were getting the support fitting their needs is people with the most severe disabilities and the most difficult behaviour would get more intervention from the staff. And that's not what you see in the bottom two lines. There may be more staff about, which you can see in the line above the bottom, in the middle line, mean staff hours per person is higher for the people in group one and group two, <coughs> actual attention received, the percent of time that people receive attention is not higher. In fact, the lowest is in group one. And even the amount of time they receive assistance, which is what you'd expect people with the most severe disabilities to require, is barely higher in group one than it is in group four. So staff attention is not really getting at what people need. Another problem with community services is the reform was based on kind of like a small ordinary house with ordinary staff and ordinary street, blah, 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 that kind of thing, and it would all work out right. Well, these data show that it all works out with a range of rightness. Some levels are really rather low and some levels are quite high. So there's variation in outcome in ostensibly similar services, houses, staffed housing. So going to the Emerson, the, the outcome I've chosen to illustrate there is level of engagement in activity. So how much time do people spend with something that we would recognize as a reasonable activity to do. And you can see the baseline there in 
Emerson and Hackney review is they also look at the, res the comparative research which compared houses to hospitals. So there's a baseline for hospitals there, two to 23%. Well, the houses is higher on average, but the lowest level, 8%, is lower than, is not higher than everything in the hospitals. It's in the range within the hospital, and so on. All of the studies have this huge range, and the lower point isn't actually any better than some of the observations that were made in the old institutions. So that's an ongoing cause of concern. Cost effectiveness evidence is equivocal, partly because the research isn't being great. There are actually no large scale studies of representative populations using comprehensive cost and outcome assessment. They just don't exist. It, it, it's a tall order because, as we'll go on to say, outcome assessment is complicated. It's just not a question of whether you assess the costs properly, which outcomes do you take as the outcomes you're going to uh, consider as the most fundamental? So most studies don't have comprehensive outcome assessment. Some actually don't have comprehensive cost assessment, which um, the health economists get very twitched about. But. So, it is a problematic literature. Some of the studies are rooted in time and context. So some are now quite old, early studies of institutionalization in the context of, of researched experimental studies. So there are studies on the Andover service, the study of the Wessex study. Well, it, it, it's not typical. What we probably know for sure is that, that there isn't a lot of cost difference between large houses and even larger services. So the idea that institutions will be have economies of scale, I think, is inaccurate. We can get down to six, seven, eight place houses without any uplift of cost per person. But moving through to three, two, one may have implications for the cost per person. A very small group because essentially you reach the point where you can't, if you've got to have staff there, then you've got to have staff there and you can't divide it. So you can't do with a, you know, you do a four, four place house with two people and it's 50, 50 you know, the ratio is two to one. You, two, you move much slower uh, much further down, and you start hitting this problem of indivisibility. Of course, it depends on staffing models. So, if you can get people into semi independent living or partially staffed housing, then you don't have to staff 24 7, then you could keep the ratios in line as you decrease in size. But not everybody can have semi independent. Okay. So that's <coughs> anyway, the institutionalization research. So what's been done since? Well, clearly what's been done since have still been studies that compare certain types of provision with other types of provision. So for example, we've done a study that compares fully staffed <coughs> provision with semi-independent living. Uh, pragmatic evaluation, if you like. But I think the overriding uh, theme of post-institutionalization research, or the one that's scientifically most innovative and most important, are those studies which aim to understand which provision features or independent variables, so those are things that are independently determined by the people who provide the service, drive the variation in outcome, the dependent variables, the outcome of the people with learning disabilities that depend on the nature of the service. So how do we understand the relationship with what we provide and how good the service is? 
And clearly, if there's the range of outcome that we illustrated in the previous slide, there's a great importance to try and understand how can we build services that always provide outcome at the higher reaches of the outcome as opposed to the lower reaches of the outcome. The other thing we've learned doing this is that the dependent variables are distinct. The different forms of outcome do not necessarily cluster together. We're dealing with a multi-dimensional outcome framework. So if you get it right on one, learning, engagement, activity, doesn't necessarily mean that you've got it right on health. And so we may need to get really complicated and design our services that have got different factors or independent variables there because of their relationship to different dependent variables or outcomes. There's unlikely to be a single overridingly important independent variable, small set of variables that we've got to do. And this is very different to the way that deinstitutionalization is pursued. And I would say some of the reformers today are the, the less, they're still trying to pull the one lever that's going to set everything right. In, in, in I was there during the deinstitutionalized era, era, so I know people argue that if you only got hospitals were large, if you only got small hospitals, were in, if, you only got, if you only got small domestic housing in Albury Street, then everything would be fine. And they found actually it wasn't. And the reason is because of this. You've got a real complexity. And it, it provides us as researchers with a scientific challenge. You've got the person, you've got their nature, how severely disabled are they, their gender, you know, the things that people bring with them, the syndrome. You've got the history. Did they go to institutions? Did they get brought up by the family? Did they have that kind of treatment? Did, you know. And you've got their context. What's the family socioeconomic status like? Where did they live? Those things may well influence outcome. Then you've got the service contribution. What nature of setting? And how would you define the setting? What's the level of resource input? Number of staff, other other factors. What's the orientation? What's the philosophy? What guides the way people approach their work? What are the procedures? What actual competence do people have? Do they follow set methods? Performance. What do they actually do when they interact with people with learning disabilities? What do they do? All of these things have a way of influencing the outcome. And the outcome is a multi-element quality of life framework. And this, I apologize for this slide. This is my, it's got a lot of words, but two things it should illustrate. One is there are a lot of outcomes we're interested in. So Sherlock's version of quality of life looks at physical well-being, such as health, etc material well-being, possessions, you know, quality of your staff, interpersonal relationships and affiliations, affection, intimacy, interaction, social inclusion, natural supports, integrated environments, participation, personal development, so your education, habilitation, activities, assistive technology, self-determination, choices, etc., your emotional well-being and your rights. I had the next to also write about quality of life. I only have five dimensions, but actually the same stuff is in those dimensions. So we won't dwell on that. The third column I want you to add just to show something that doesn't come out of an academic track of people hypothesizing about this term quality of life. This is the United Nations Convention for People with Disabilities. And what you see there is largely the same kind of content area. The bit that's light is emotional well-being, because 
The interesting thing about the United Nations Convention of Human Rights is that all the outcomes are objective. There's none of this subjective nonsense about what people feel. It's objective. Have people got the rights or have they not got the rights? Are they discriminated against or not? And that's an objective assessment. But kind of content areas are largely the same. So this is kind of flow diagram. We've got people who've got various characteristics. In a service environment with a kinds of resource input, so we might describe those as the size and number of people living together or <coughs> grouping. Are they all people with a similar level of disability or are they a spectrum of disability? Building design, material standards, through the staff type qualifications, staff demographics. Do the demographics of staff, for example, mimic the demographics of the people living there? Or have you got a group of middle-aged people and learning disabilities all looked after by a group of staff in their teens and their early twenties? Some of these things might be important. We need to bear those things in mind. And then you've got their orientation and their the procedures they follow. So, what kind of mission statements has the agency set? What kind of autonomy has the household got to run its own life? What's, what are the staff roles? <coughs> are they carers? Are they supporters? Are they supposed to be doing the cooking and cleaning? Or what are the roles? What are the job descriptions say? Like? How are they recruited? How are they trained? How are they assessed? What working methods do people run? Do they do person-centered planning? Do they do systematic teaching? Do they do active support, PBS or what? And then <coughs> staff performance. The way staff act, does that promote opportunity? Does it promote choice? Does it give attention, give assistance to people to do things for themselves? Or does it take away opportunity, take away choice, take away opportunities to do things for themselves? Deny, tell people they can't do it. What have we learned about personal characteristics as independent variables, so things that influence outcomes? There's fairly strong literature now that the objective quality of life indicators co-vary with, with various measures of the degree of se severity of disability, either IQ or in the result score on an adaptive behaviour scale. So home likeness, if you're more severely disabled, you're more likely to live in a home that's less home-like. You're likely to have restricted variety and frequency of social and community activities, contact with family members, less choice and control, less engagement in constructive activity. Other characteristics, once you've controlled for level of adaptive behaviour, um, have a much weaker effect in our, in our reading of the literature. The impact of age, gender, challenge behaviour is less <laughs> strong, although it can, they can have an effect, but it's an effect that is um, <laughs> particular to particular to outcome. But we know very little <coughs> about family socioeconomic status, residential history, treatment history, and other <coughs> wider factors that are that the people carry with them, but we don't measure with our Scouts. And selection bias, because of that, some of the research is still dubious. Because selection bias can be a problem. A lot of a lot of the research designs are you take one group living here, you take another group living in a kind of different type of service, and you compare outcomes. And you try and eliminate the, the differences that are due to the differences between the types of people. Mainly we do that with residential services. We can't random, you can't randomise people to service setting. It's, it's unethical. You know, so with drug treatment, you have randomised groups and that kind of, it's not guaranteed, but it kind of 
sorts out these kinds of problems. But these kinds of settings, these kinds of research have real problems with how do you know the groups of the site that you're comparing? And so we did this nice study, we thought it was a lovely study, about the quality costs of fully staffed group homes and semi-independent living. A bloke called Roger Stanley in Australia had already done a study and come out with certain results, and we thought, well, that's a good one, we'll see it over here. And we match the groups on adaptive behaviour, on challenging behaviour, on psychiatric status, and a couple of other things as well. And we did the study and we found differences between the two groups. But after we'd done the study, we found that people differed on placement history. That the people who came in to just go around the side of it. But by and large, the study showed that people who lived in semi independent living had better outcomes in terms of community contacts and various other things than the people who lived in fully staffed group homes. And costs were considerably low. So you would be inclined to conclude in favour of semi independent living. But then we found that placement history differed and the people who lived in semi-independent living were more likely to have come to directly from the communities that they currently lived in. In fact, probably from conditions of greater independence than they now have. Whereas the people who lived in fully staffed group homes were more likely to come through an institutional group and as we know, institutions have a tendency to have disrupted past types of connections because they dislocated people from origin before they relocated people back. So maybe the groups differed after all, and maybe the interpretation was different in terms of there being a better outcome, better social and community outcomes for one group than the other. It's more to do with the characteristics of the people than the nature of the services. And I, I mentioned this just to illustrate the complexity of doing good work in this area. But, we also have good evidence that different independent variables, different ways of providing the service, make a difference to outcomes. So I mentioned the Andover houses before. They were houses that Judith Jenkins and um, Jim Mansell and I set up in the late 70s and the first one in the late 80s with Sandy Tugan as the person, first person in charge. And our idea was we were um, very struck by the applied behavior analysis literature and the, in particular, achieve, a, a project called Achievement Place and a project that Todd Rizzi ran about infant centers and daycare centers in which they tried to structure the environment to produce certain behavioral outcomes. And we wanted to try and do this. And so, as well as them being relatively small and in ordinary housing and with a decent number of staff and being well located and close to amenities, we had tried to specify an orientation that had very clear outcomes and a kind of way of working that matched to every outcome. So, if you wanted people to learn, we had a way of teaching. If you wanted people to have alternative to challenging behaviour, we had an approach. If you wanted people to have engagement and activity, we had the origins of what became active support. So there was a way of working matched to uh, outcomes. And we evaluated these houses. And then when I moved to South Wales, we did another study. And in many ways, in, quarter, in, in terms of the way people thought at the time, the South Welsh houses ought to have been better because they were smaller, they had more staff, they had lots and lots of normalisation and values training, they had similar levels of household autonomy. But what they lacked compared to the Adelaide houses was any of this uh, <coughs> clarity of working methods. So in a way, comparing Andover houses and South Wales looks at method of work, orientation and method of working as a 
kind of settle independent America. So these graphs, these histograms show if you're an individual who live in any of these houses, how much time do you get attention from staff? What's the percentage of your of the observational period that you get attention from staff? And how much of that time is assistance from staff to help you do something that you otherwise couldn't do? So that's instruction, demonstration, physical prompting, physical guidance, all those kinds of interactions. So there are only two Andover houses, but what you see there is the level of um, each member who who lives in the two houses on average gets some level of attention for 20 to 28 percent of the time but three quarters of it is in the form of assistance so levels of assistance are about 14 and 22 percent for the two houses and then we've got 15 houses in south wales that are in fact, numbered by ascending average adaptive behaviour scale score. So the people who are on average the most severely disabled are in house one, and a couple of guys who are really able and independent lived in house 15. And what you see there is that the level of attention that people receive isn't any high, it certainly isn't higher than in the end of the house, even though the, the staffing ratio is what I and in some houses considerably less some are up there with the end of house but the level of assistance is very much low okay and then you look at the engagement and activity of the people who live in the houses and here you because we've already said that one of the things that influence that is the level of adaptive behaviour of the people themselves, you've got to look for a like-to-like -like comparison. So the ABS scores are listed there, and basically the average of the two Andover houses matches the average of the first six of the South Welsh houses. And what we have here is the black is engagement in domestic activity, the orange is leisure and personal activity added together, and then the line is people's total engagement activity that includes social interaction, which can obviously come at the same time as the other forms of activity, and that's why you can't just add it as a history. <laughs> and again, what I would submit is the level of engagement in the two Andover houses is superior to that in the first six Andover houses and equivalent to those in houses seven through about 13, where people with considerably higher independent abilities live. So there's a, I would say that the, the way these houses are managed and operate it makes a difference on the outcomes of the people. Okay, so post institutionalization research, we my colleague John Perry and I did a book chapter which tried to look at all of the studies that had compared had tried to work on either comparing different types of services that, that, that differ in certain respects with match participants' designs, or looking at services and using multivariate statistical analysis to try and work out how the outcomes related to the nature of the service. And these are the results. Science has a weak effect. This kind of critical variable that people have banged on about in policy forever and ever isn't actually all that important. It is, I'm not saying that it's not in, that we can go back to very large sizes. Because all sorts of things change when you go back to very large sizes. But within 
the numbers of people who might live within some form of ordinary housing, be it one through to six, it really doesn't make a difference whether it's six, five or six or one or two. The strongest links are to home likeness. Smaller houses tend to be more home like and self determination, which is probably to do with um, people living in smaller groups getting more choice and having it's less complicated, isn't it, to accommodate choice with small numbers than large numbers. Home likeness, having a home that looks like a home is decorated like a home, is equipped like a home, is important, and so is living in the community. They're desirable things. One thing that does is constrain size to the type of group that we're looking at, so the non-institutional group. And the things it's related to are, it seems to have an impact on the opportunities for activities that people have, but also on the attitudes and orientations of staff. The less institutional the building appears to be, the more, the less institutional the orientation and attitudes of staff appear to be. Type of neighbourhood, we know very little. Whether people get on better in a kind of working class area, middle class area, I don't know. We, we know it's not really been studied. Resu resource input, <coughs> remarkably ineffective. Bring out numbers of staff, which are the main component of the cost of these services, doesn't relate to outcome. Orientation, attitudes, working methods is important, as I hope I illustrated already. We need to understand this better. Poor staff performance may explain why there's no good link between the numbers of staff and outcome. I mean, if they're all doing well, what do you think? You know, all a bit of a nightmare, all a bit of a mess, no wonder it doesn't feed through in producing better outcomes. Not to say that the staff aren't needed, it's just that they're not well utilised because uh, working methods are being incompetent to the being so, I have no idea where I'm at. I've been done for 50 years, next 50 years. I'll go quickly. Um, so, best evidence at the moment on housing design is support arrangements can have beneficial and adverse effects. So, for example, in Eric Emerson's study of supported living, there was great choice for people there, but they also had a poorer diet. So we have to get away from this idea that, that a type of service will be uniformly linked with a range of better outcomes. We have to build <coughs> service ingredients for different outcomes. <coughs> There's an advantage of normative home-like accommodation close to community amenities. More staff per person does not mean better outcome. Too many staff can, in fact, inhibit choice, they inhibit independence, and they may inhibit participation in activity because the staff themselves are competitors for the activity in the environment, and they like to keep busy as well. More staff may not even increase attention from staff. This, this relationship may be moderated by the severity of disability of the people. So, for example, Roger Stanton has done a study in which more staff was associated with less community involvement, but amongst groups with moderate and mild disabilities, whereas one of our studies for people with more severe and profound disabilities found that more staff led to more community involvement. So, staffing and support do need to be matched to the needs of service users. And I would say the staff need to be trained with a number of competencies, which include individualization of approach and some form of active support. And in addition, we've got to think about what competencies staff might need to make sure that people have good health, have alternatives to challenging behavior, learn skills, 
maximise choice and control and extend social relationships and are safeguarded from abuse and exploitation. Right. Look into the future. There's a challenge of increasing population. Numbers, um, it's a good news story. People are not dying young anymore. <coughs> so the numbers of people living beyond their 40th year is increasing. So the age profile of learning disabilities is approaching that of the general population. It hasn't reached that yet, but it's approaching the general population. That dip from 15 to 19 is moving out. So, for example, and the implications of this are in, in this Emerson and Hackney report published in 2008, that in the, by 2021, so in the 30 years from 2008, England will need an additional 20,000 places for older adults uh, to be provided. So an increase, uh, implication for increased residential out of family provision. Wales is a smaller country, so the numbers are smaller, but these show the numbers on learning disability registers in Wales. Uh, between 1990 and 2014, and I just draw your attention to the figures highlighted in blue there. There's an increase of almost 50% in those 15 years, and you can see the numbers growing of people over 65 years has increased, as well as the numbers between 60 and 64. And we estimate that 12 hundred more residential places will be needed to be provided in Wales for out of, staff out of family placement to return Wales to the 1990 position in terms of the absolute number of people with adults with learning disabilities who are dependent on extended family care. So the people that are currently picking up slack are families in the situation got worse than Okay, where's comprehensiveness gone? The Wessex services were based on comprehensiveness. Nimrod was developed on the basis of comprehensively providing this small territory and over comprehensively providing the small territory. We believe in locally based <laughs> services. Ordinary life is comprehensive locally based services for people with learning disabilities. It's gone. These are the proportions of councils with social services responsibility supported residents aged 18 to 64 supported out of area in the government office regions of England and the lowest percentage is 24 percent and the highest percentage is 63 percent not even local this is not even in your region Things are neither comprehensive nor equal. So the proportion of adults in family homes in Wales is illustrated there. And every um, Wales, unfortunately, got the full Thatcher unified unitary local government area. So even though it's only a population of 2.9 million, it's got 22 local authorities. So those those are the 22 local authorities illustrated. And the mean. Proportion of adults in family homes in Wales is 49%, which actually, funnily enough, is about the same as in the 1963 Wessex survey. But you can see the lowest is 31%, and the, six, and the highest is 63%. So there's a really very different prospect for families and individuals, depending on which local authority you live in. So you're likely to be able to move on out of the family home when the time comes. So, absence of inequality, absence of comprehensiveness. So we need to re-emphasize comprehensiveness and equality. And I think we need to introduce planning for territories based on epidemiological evidence. And in that current problem, policies are problematic. I may be wrong, I don't think so. I don't think that 
any provision targets, numerical provision targets, stated in any UK policy. When um, Boeing people came out, Jim Mansell and I actually had a conversation about whether we write a, a re critical review based on this point. We were going to call it better services 10, value services nil, referring to the number of numerical targets for better services and the number for inbound people. And actually, Jim decided for political reasons, about making a bad name for himself, that he didn't want to do it. And I was OK because I was over in Wales. But it illustrates the point that, that we, we gave up a lot. You cannot now go to the policies and, and Say to an authority, you're not providing enough because you've got no very targets anymore. We had an emphasis on personalization. Now I don't want to knock personalization and person centered planning. It's all right in its own place, but we have to recognize <coughs> that it's not powerful enough to change dispositions of money. The people who do it aren't even senior enough in their or in their hierarchy have control of the budgets. They can't initiate packages for people in need. As we've seen, the people in need is growing. So PCPs all very well, and it may work reasonably well for people who already got existing packages. You can rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic. But we need strategic, epidemiological based packages to bring the level, the sense of level of need up to 2016 and not have it rooted in some date in the past. What's going to happen to the model of services? Actually, I don't really know. I can be very doomy and pessimistic, so I won't be. But proponents who are arguing for reform appear to be very confident about how to improve services. It's all going to happen with personalization. Maybe it'll happen with individual budgets, that sort of thing. I think this is yet yeah, further a, a new example of that if we only pull the right lever, everything will fall into place. I don't think it takes on board the current evidence that was set with that such reform would ignore the important independent variables about how you train staff. How staff work, what work, what competencies people have. And those are largely associated with organizations. You know, if you get an individual budget and you, you employ your army from around the corner, what are the mechanisms for training army around I'm nothing against armies around the corner, it's very good. But what's the mechanism for training them? What's the mechanism for giving them confidence? How do, you, how do you make sure they interact with people in ways that promote outcome? That points to the importance of continued evaluation. And at the moment, we have a deficit of that. There are very few groups, because we've done evaluating the institutionalization and evaluating group homes. There's a feeling that it's, it's all over. But actually, we need to do more to understand what drives outcome in these kinds of facilities, not less. And we need to continue to evaluate the kinds of reforms that are being put in place. I think one of the current ob impact, um, obstacles to doing this well scientifically is we actually have quite a good operationalization of the outcomes we want people to achieve. We have a relatively core operation, operationalization or typology of the independent variables <coughs> that I think are important. I mean, I've sketched out what I think in this presentation tonight, but somebody else might have a different list. And what we don't have is any international consensus. So we have studies sometimes, but they don't all study the, they may study the same outcome, but they're not all studying the relationship of the same thing to that outcome. So we, we can't put them together and form a bigger scientific picture. So there's considerable scope to further understand. I mentioned the 
support for the um, shrinking of the research on support arrangement and we need to evidence this and show it's happening and we need to challenge it. And the possible threat I think that lies in the future is that gains may be reversed given the pressure to accommodate more people in ongoing austerity. And I think it's probably still a continuing belief in economies of scale. So people come up with the idea that if we only accommodate people in large groups, we'll do it cheaper. And they may be right to some extent. <coughs> but because there's an inadequate understanding of what factors are important to quality, the likelihood is those kinds of reactions will ignore the important thing. And there will be a failure to safeguard what is important to the outcomes of people when looking for comments. And so we need to tighten this uh, knowledge that we do have in relation to, to the what drives outcomes. So in conclusion, I finally got that. Initial reform is associated with research, and that actually allows experimentation. The early studies that I mentioned where went ahead because we, it was an evaluation. We were all going to be evaluated and it was all small beer. Um, evaluation has shown how far deinstitutionalization took us. Those great improvements, great, great improvements, but some ongoing areas of research. <coughs> Post deinstitutionalization, research has begun to produce an understanding of the arrangements which produce quality of people. But we haven't done enough to be sure about everything. And it doesn't look like the current reformers are listening to us anyway. So we need to somehow, the research community needs to kind of feed that in and get the reformers to listen. But if anyone there is a future researcher in learning disability, there's a hell of an opportunity now to build on the current evidence and demonstrate the complexity of what is required. If you're looking for simple solutions, you won't find them. But if you're looking to do painstaking work that works out what you have to do to give people a good life, there's a lot of exciting stuff to do.